Take out your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Samuel 23. 1 Samuel 23. David is on the run from Saul. Saul is descending into bitter into a bitterness and disobedience and anger fueled state of madness he's he's really slipping and as we read here we'll we'll look a little bit at at we'll, we'll look back at chapter 22 he's gotten to that paranoid point where as a grown man he's upset and he's talking about why why nobody likes him and he's he's just he he doesn't sound like he's in a good place Saul ordered the slaughter of the priests of Nob because of uh, Ahimelech helping David. Saul's soldiers wouldn't obey his command. They, he, he told them, kill the priests of the Lord. And they said, no, we're not going to kill the priests of the Lord. They were, they were men of faith, apparently. And, uh, and so they wouldn't obey his command. So Doeg, the Edomite, stepped forward and killed 84 priests and their families, and then he went to their hometown of Nob and slaughtered the entire town. Man, woman, child, uh, babies, the animals. He killed everything that had to do with Nob, almost as if they were the enemies of God. That was what God had told Saul to do to the children of Amalek, but he didn't. But Doeg did that to the priests of the Lord. One of the priests, however, Abiathar, escaped, and he ran and found David. David was hiding in the forest of Hareb which is the central region of, of, uh, of Judah. David was told that the Philistines were sending raiding parties into Israel against the city of Keilah in chapter 23, verse 1. And so David and his private army, now numbering 600 warriors, went up to Keilah, and they defeated the Philistines, but this action kind of raised the attention of Saul. You can't, you can't go and deliver a town with your private army and, and not hope to make the headlines, and that's exactly what happened. So Saul, so Saul knows now that, that uh, David is in Keilah, and he's excited. He says, God has delivered David into my hand because Keilah is a city with gates and bars, which we, we take to mean it, it only had one way in, one way out. So if I can get there fast enough, I can bottle David up in Keilah and I can do away with him, which was Saul's ultimate goal. But we know David heard and, and he got away. In spite of the service that David did, though, in driving away the Philistines from their city, the people of Keilah actually played a part in betraying David into the hand of Saul. But David escaped from Keilah and he runs toward the wilderness of Ziph. And while in the wilderness of Ziph, Jonathan comes to David. Take a look at verse 16. We looked at this last week, but just to get a running start. Not last week, two weeks ago. And Jonathan, verse 16, Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of, of Saul, my father, shall not find thee, and and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. And that also Saul my father knoweth. And they too made a covenant before the Lord. And David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. So Jonathan came, strengthened his hand in the Lord, which we, we talked about. Uh, what, that's what friends do. That's what friends are for. He came along and, and just encouraged David in the things of the Lord. Strengthened his hands in God, and then they went their separate ways. But we come tonight to a betrayal in Ziph, verse 19. Then came up the Ziphites. Aren't you glad you don't live in Ziph? <laughs> then came up the Ziphites to Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not Saul, or doth not David hide himself with us in strongholds in the wood, in the, in the hill of Hakila, which is in the south of Jeshimon? Now, there's, there's a couple of things that are kind of interesting here. Right on the heels of David being encouraged and strengthened in God by Jonathan, the Ziphites turn on him, and they, they betray him into the hands of Saul. Have you ever experienced in your life that it seems that times of great encouragement are often followed by times of, of attack and times of discouragement, times of darkness? That's exactly what's going on here. David, he goes from kind of a high point. He's been encouraged. He's got to see his, his closest friend, Jonathan. And then right after that, he's betrayed. 
It's interesting, we read in verse 19 that the people of Ziph actually went to Gibeah. Now this is, this is significant because if you look here, Ziph is, is right there, it's right by the number 11, it's kind of right in the center. And uh, Ziph is a long way from Gibeah. Gibeah is way up here. If you, you follow up the, the line, you go to Ziph, to Hebron, to Bethlehem, to Jebus, to Nob, to Gibeah. It's 30 miles plus as the crow flies. Now, I, I mentioned this when we were talking about uh, uh, Joseph and Mary taking a trip. The, the way the crow flies and the way the donkey walks aren't the same. Okay? So we're talking about a, a meandering journey that would have taken some days, two days, probably at least, for the, the people of Ziph to go all the way up to Gibeah to say to Saul, hey, we heard that you're looking for David, and David is at our, he's in our city, he's hiding. Well, they tell Saul about what's going on. They say that David is in the hill of Hakilah. It's an unknown location. We don't know exactly where it is, but likely it's east of Ziph toward the Dead Sea. And they also mention Jeshimon, which is uh, perhaps scholars think that perhaps it was another name for the wilderness of Judea. So kind of a, a, a larger area. Verse 20. Now, therefore, the Ziphites are continuing to talk. Now, therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of thy soul to come down. And our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. Saul, you come down. We know where he is. You come down. We'll hand him over, and, and all will be well. They seem to be trying to ingratiate themselves with their unstable king, don't they? Do you, do you kind of get that feeling as you read, just the way that they talk? It's worthy of, of our noting for, by way of application. Saul's mental state. Again, brought on by disobedience and rebellion, has placed him in a position where he's easily manipulated. Saul is very pliable. In the hands of the right person, they can push him to do whatever they want. In this case, he's got the probably the elders of this city, the, the leaders of this city, come up and they say, Oh king, we know where your enemy is. We'll hand him over. All you have to do, all you have to do is make the trip down. And we'll put him in your hands. Do, do you figure they, they were just trying to be nice? Or do you figure they wanted something? I'll bet they wanted something. I don't have on biblical authority. But when, when government comes in and they say, we just want to do you a solid. Probably you should look for fine print. Okay? And, and here Saul has placed himself through his disobedience, through his rebellion. He's placed himself in a position where he's easily manageable. He's very pliable to good or to bad, but it seems like he attracts all of the wrong crowd. Verse 21, And Saul said, Blessed be ye of the Lord, for ye have, ye have compassion on me. If you look back at verse 7, Saul has persuaded himself that God is on his side. When David was shut up in Keilah, he says, and it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah, and Saul said, God hath delivered him into my hand. And now Saul believes that, that God has sent the people of Zip to betray, betray David into his hands. Again, it's this manufactured peace that we talked about last time. You need to be careful of that. As people, as, as human beings, we like to rationalize. We like to reason our way into stuff. And Saul has had enough time with his thoughts where he's, he's talked himself into to believing, I'm doing the right thing. God's on my side. And so he's 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 sold on this fact. Yes, sir. Are these Jews? Yes. Yeah. Yep. They would be Jews, very likely of Ju of the tribe of Judah. Yep. Now Saul believes that God has sent the people of Ziph, and Saul has found uh, here in verse 21, Saul has found someone to pity him. He says, Ye have compassion on me. If you look back in chapter 22, verse 8. Saul is bewailing the fact that he doesn't have any friends and nobody likes him and everybody hates him. And he's, he's in that very un, unstable state. He says in verse 22, he said, or verse 8 of chapter 22, there's none of you that is sorry for me. That's not how you want your leader to talk, but that's how he's talking. And now he's got these, the Ziphites, and he says, oh, but you, you feel sorry for me. 
So he's, he's got these people who he believes are, are handing him over according to the will of God. Again, by way of application, beware of people who try to make you feel better in your sin. When you're in sin, and when I'm in sin, I don't need somebody to come up and put their arm around me and say, it's okay, you're doing all right. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about that in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 5. It says, open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. What will a friend do when you're in sin? They'll come up next to you, and they'll take their Bible, and, their, and they'll say, hey, this is what you're doing, and this is what God's Word says, and the two don't match up. You need to get right. That's what a friend will do. In this case, Saul is wrong. It, it doesn't take, we can read these words thousands of years later, and all of us, as we read these words, we say, he's not right. He's, he's way off. But Saul is surrounding himself with people who make him feel good. You have compassion on me. God has sent you. This is how it's supposed to be. I'm doing the right thing. And he's rationalized it in his mind to the point where he feels like he's on God's side. And God is on his side. And all is as it should be. Beware of people who make you feel better in your sin. As in this case, the Ziphites did for Saul. Saul continues in verse 22. He says, go, I pray you. Prepare yet, and, and know, and see his place where his haunt is, and who had seen him there. For it is told me that he de dealeth very subtly. Saul wants more information before he commits his time. It's a long way from Gibeah to Ziph. It was a long way from Gibeah to Keilah. What happened when Saul made the trip from Gibeah to Keilah? What happened when he got there? David was gone. So he's trying to avoid that. It's a, long, it's a long haul, and he's taking a large crowd. We'll look at next, next week when we get into, into chapter 24. We'll see the size of his army. He's toting 3,000 plus with him. It takes a lot to move 3,000 men 30 plus miles. And so Saul's not wanting to get there and find that David has flown the coop again. So he says, look, I, I need more information. I need you to do a little bit more uh, reconnaissance here and determine David's habits. I want, you to, I want you to be able to tell me where he goes and when he goes there. And I don't want it just from one person. I want multiple people who tell me this is what David's doing because I'm going to make the trip. This needs to be the time that I get him. says, for it is told me that he dealeth very subtly, meaning craftily or cunningly. He, he feels like David's doing all of this on purpose. David's, he's, he's working against me. He's being sneaky. Now, is David having to sneak? Yeah, he's having to sneak because Saul's after him. But, but Saul's misinterpreting all of this. Verse 23, Saul's continually talking. He says, see therefore and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself. Lurking places. That doesn't sound like, like a place that, that you would want to be or a place where someone who you like would hang out. But he says, I want to take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself and come ye again to me with the certainty and I will go with you. I, I want this to be a sure thing. And it shall come to pass if he be in the land that I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Judah. Saul doesn't just want to know where David has been and where he is now. He wants to know all of David's hiding places. He says, I need to know all of his haunts, all of his hiding places, so that if he's not where you say he is, I can go to another one of his hiding places. I need to know all of his lurking spots. You know where all your kids' hiding spots are? So, so that when you can't find them where they're supposed to be, you know, well, I need to go and I need to pull the couch out, right? Saul's wanting that for David. I want to know exactly where he is, and if he's not there, I want to know his other hiding places so that I can find him when I get there. And so Saul sends the men of Ziph home. Again, two days at least from Gibeah down to Ziph. He sends them on this journey. He tells them to come back when they have this information and they would return to Gibeah and pass this new info along. So if you think about it, Saul is giving David about a week's head start. Because he sent the men of Ziph 
back down. And he says, I want you to go down and I want you to find out all of this stuff about David. And then I want you to come back two days. And then I want you to tell me where everything is. And then we'll go back. Another two days at least, probably more with 3,000 men plus. So we're talking about five to seven days that he's giving David as a head start. <coughs> Saul is determined that this is going to be the time when he catches David. He even says there in verse 23, he says, I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Judah. Look, I'm, I'm going to come, I'm going to stay till I find him. If I have to knock on every door, if I have to check in every doghouse and cow shed, I'm going to find David this time, is his mentality. Which, let's pause here for just a second, and let's talk about the molding of a man after God's own heart. What is David doing during this time, and does David have any idea what's happening in Gibeah? Well, we don't have it from this passage, but we do have it on scriptural authority that David does know what's going on in Gibeah. You know how he knows? God told him. God told David what was going on. God is using all of these experiences. I want you to think, it's been years since David was anointed to be the next king of Israel. David knows that he's going to be the next king of Israel. Why did God anoint him and then wait? I mean, we're talking decades before David would actually take the throne of a united kingdom. It's going to be decades. Why would God anoint him king and then let him sit, or in this case, run? Why would God do that? Well, God is allowing David to have these wilderness experiences, these hard times, this life on the run. For the same reason that God allowed Moses to tend sheep in the wilderness of Midian for 40 years before he had him lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. God is using this time in David's life. He's molding him a man after his own heart. We read in Acts 13, 22. He, that's what David's called there. A man after God's own heart. God is using this time to knock off David's rough edges. To sand away. We've used the illustration of the of the the sculptor who who somebody said how do you how do you sculpt this horse? He says, well, it's easy. I just come in with a hammer and chisel and I knock away everything that doesn't look like a horse, right? And and God is using this in the life of David to knock away everything that doesn't look how it should. He's making a leader of men. You think about it, the children of Israel got Saul because they said, give us a king like the other nations. And God gave him Saul, and he looked the part, but he was rotten. And God is, God is molding and making and customizing a king after his own heart. To prove that, turn with me to Psalm 57. <coughs> Psalm 57 was written at this time. So flip over there and you'll see Psalm 57 has one of those psalm titles, and it says, to the chief musician on Neganoth, Mashiel, which we, we think, given what we can determine, that that's talking about <coughs> what instruments it's supposed to be played upon. Then it says, in, in the psalm title, so at the top of your psalm, before, before verse 1, it says, a psalm of David with the Ziphims. So called something different, they're called Ziphites, in 1 Samuel, called Ziphims here, came and said to Saul, doth not David hide himself with us? So David knows because God told him, and David sat down in the wilderness of, of central Judah, and he penned these words under divine inspiration. He says in verse 1, he says, Save me, O God, by thy name, and judge me by thy strength. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers are risen up against me, and oppressors seek after my soul. They have not set God before them, Selah. Behold, God is mine helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. He shall reward evil unto mine enemies. Cut them off in thy truth. I will freely sacrifice unto thee. Do you notice the change of tone here? He starts off, Lord, help, help. And then he changes to praise. Verse 6, I will freely sacrifice unto thee. <laughs> I will praise thy name, O Lord, for it is good. <coughs> for he hath delivered me out of all trouble, and mine eye hath seen his desire upon mine enemies. 
These are the words of a man who is aware of how serious the situation is, but the same faith that led David as a young lad to charge out into the valley of Elah with a, a sling and five stones in a pouch and a stick is the same faith that leads him here in Psalm 57 to say, you know what, God's got this in control. Yes, sir. If he was still maturing, maturing Jesus, or was he still relative as a young man at this point? Well, relatively, yes. He would be in some... Late 20s, maybe? Or? I would say probably late 20s, maybe early 30s, just as an estimate. David would have been uh, a, a young to mid-teenager when he killed Goliath, and then he's gotten married and, and such, and so he, some time has passed. Uh, could could be up to a decade, maybe a little bit longer, so 10, 12, 15 years probably, realistically. Yes, ma'am? I think it is Psalm 54. Psalm 54. Did I grab the wrong one? That, <laughs> well, Psalm 57 that, 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 could, that could be. Psalm, let me take a look. Yes, Psalm 54. I'm sorry about that. Jonathan's quite a bit older, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Yep, Jonathan. Jonathan was old enough to be David's father. Okay, so con considerably older. We think of them as young men about the same age. Jonathan could could very likely have been David's father at this point. Yes. So these words that David writes here in Psalm 54 are words that written in faith. A man who understands exactly what what God has for him. That God is doing a work. That God is making a difference in his life. But the chase is on. Take a look at verse 24. Because the Ziphites, the Ziphim, just sold David down the river to Saul. Verse 24. And they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain of the south of Jeshimon. So the men of Ziph returned to find that David has, in fact, slipped away, just as they, they thought just as Saul had, had been afraid of. And now he's in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain south of Jeshimon. So here's, here's as close as we have. Maon, okay? You have Ziph. Maon, about five miles straight south, okay? There's another little, little village. You have Carmel, okay? Not Mount Carmel, okay? Mount Carmel is way over on the coast and much higher. The town of Carmel here in the, in the, in the tribe of Judah and he's down in Maon, down here, and he's, he's hiding with his men. How effectively can you hide with 600 men and all their stuff and, and all of their entourage? It, it would be hard, but he's hiding down here in this area. I'll, I'll show you a little bit more. It, it, would, it wouldn't be as hard as we would think. It, it's a whole lot easier than it would be to hide 600 men in this area. Verse 25, and Saul also and his men went to seek him. And they told David, wherefore he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. It says that he came to a rock. Very likely, this would be a landmark, a rock, a big enough rock that everybody knew which, which rock you're talking about. That rock out there by Maon. Okay? And so David comes to this, and, uh, and he's, he's there in this area. And Saul now has enough information, and he and his troops move in to trap David. They've made the trip from Gibeah. We don't know how many days have elapsed, but it's been more than, more than two, likely. And he comes down, and verse 26, And Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul, for Saul and his men can pass David and his men around about to take them. So, David and his 600 men are hiding. Now, here's the terrain. This is what it looks like in the area in which they're hiding. So, a little bit easier than to hide it in the flatlands of Iowa. They're, they're able to slip into these canyons and whatnot. They're able to hide on the other side of a mountain, which is exactly what they're doing in this case. But as you can tell from these mountains, you don't go over them. Necessarily, You certainly don't go straight over them. You have to find a path, so you have to find a valley that goes around. And so David is on, very likely in this case, he would be on the east side, and Saul comes in on the west side. And we read here that Saul compasses David about, meaning that 
David is on this side of the mountain, and Saul divides his forces, and he sends him around in a flanking maneuver to encircle David, and he brings in all of his, all of his troops. Again, if we look at <coughs> chapter 24, about 3,000, assuming this is around the same group, they come in, and they're surrounding David. They're closing the noose. They're about ready to close the trap all the way. David is surrounded. Saul's ready. Now, I want you to take just a moment, and I want you to flip back to Psalm 17, or I'll put it on the screen. It'll be small, but maybe you can read it. Listen to the words that are said here and see if you pick up anything. In Psalm 17, verse 9, it says, From the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about. Does that sound familiar? The compassing me about. That's what we just read. Saul was doing. They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. They've, they've now compassed us in our steps. <coughs> they've set their eyes bowing down to the earth. Like as a lion that is greedy of his prey. And as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him. Cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. I, I think very likely this was written around the same time. David finds himself, uh, I'm surrounded. I'm in a bad place. Militarily, hard to, hard to fight when you're surrounded, especially when you're surrounded by an, by an outnumbering force. And when you have your back up against a mountain and you can't go anywhere, David's in a bad place. But just in the nick of time, just as it says here, arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, just in the nick of time, deliverance. Look at verse 27. But there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste thee, and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Just as Saul is getting ready to close the noose around the neck of David, word comes. Some breathless messenger runs into his camp and says, The Philistines, they just arrived. We need to go. And so Saul doesn't even have time to close his trap all the way. He doesn't have time to do what he, he wishes he could do, because the Philistines have invaded Saul is wasting time chasing imaginary threats while actual threats are coming into reality. What danger did David pose to Saul? Absolutely zero. Okay? What danger did the Philistines pose to Saul? Very great. Here they are invading the land again. And Saul's out chasing David down in a place he really doesn't have any business being. We'll talk of that in a moment. Verse 28. Wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore they called that place Selah Hamalakot. Okay? I said that an awful lot this afternoon. Selah Hamalakot. Okay? And if I'm not saying it right, you say it to me out here at the door and I'll hear how you say it. Okay? They, they come to this place, this the rock. You remember David went down to the rock? Okay. Very likely, this rock gets renamed. The rock is that he's camped near is given a new name. The name itself means a cliff of escape or a rock of division. Okay. Why? Well, because he and Saul divided that they, they parted ways. We sing the song, Here I Raise Mine Ebenezer. When we sing, Come Thou Fount, Ebenezer being a rock of remembrance. That actually comes from 1 Samuel. Aren't you glad that this didn't make it into the song? It'd be a whole lot more syllables uh, that we would have to figure out how to say. But here, here they come down. Saul comes to this, this rock and they divide company. Saul has to run. Why is he after? Well, because he's the king and his land has just been invaded by an actual enemy this time. Verse 29, and David went out from thence and dwelt in strongholds at En Gedi. Saul charges off to the west to meet the Philistines, and David slips away to the east to come to the strongholds of En Gedi. Here's a map of what we're talking about. The, you see Philistia on the extreme, uh, the extreme west side of this map. So Saul is down here near Ziph, down in central Judah. And he gets word that, that David, uh, or that the Philistines have invaded, so he shoots off to the west. David goes to the east. And you see En Gedi right there on the, on the western shore of the Dead Sea. That's where David is going to be. And, and this, 
is what En Gedi looks like. Look like a good place to hide 600 men? Looks pretty good to me. So David goes down into this, and you see the, the different valleys and all of the different things. But if you get up close and you look at what's actually in En Gedi, a lot of these are limestone. They're soft stone. And so En Gedi is just chock full of caves. And so some of these caves, massive. Some of them football stadium size. You go back in, and just it opens up to massive massive proportions. And so David is in this area. Saul's off to the west fighting the Philistines. David is now here in the hold and in the strongholds of En Gedi. And that's where we're going to leave him. That's where this chapter ends. But let's grab a couple of applications. A couple of applications. Number one, beware of people who make you feel better about your sin. Okay? For Saul, it was the people of Ziph. The people of Zeph came up and they made him feel like God was on his side. God wasn't on his side. God had forsaken Saul back chapters ago, decades before. True friends confront and they seek to restore. If you've ever had to do that as a friend, you know it's not easy. Okay? Only a true friend would. Okay, uh, an enemy would make you feel good in your, in your sin. Only a true friend would come alongside, take their Bible, and say, Brother or sister, I love you. That's why I'm showing you from God's word what there, there's a problem. That's what a friend would do. Number two, don't despise the times that God uses wilderness experiences to shape you into the person he wants you to be. It would have been real easy for David to say, Lord... I've already been anointed. Why are we doing this? Why am I running all over creation down here, hiding in caves when I'm already king? By rights, I'm king. Well, God was using this. God is using these times of, of near misses and close escapes. God is using these, these things to form David into a man after his own heart and a man who he can use, who will lead his people, his chosen people, the Jews, into a new and a better place. The last lesson, and I, I want to phrase this as delicately as I can, sin makes you stupid, doesn't it? Where was Saul when the Philistines attacked? He was down chasing David, the one man who was probably the most loyal to him, he was chasing down with his army. Meanwhile, he's being invaded at his rear. That's what sin does. Sin distracts us. Sin takes our eyes off of what God would have us to be focused on. Sin makes you make stupid mistakes. We look at this and we say, what a harebrained thing to do. How could, how could a man, he's, he's a grown adult. This is, this is something you'd expect a child to do. Sin, sin will do that. Sin will, will make you uh, take you into a place that doesn't make any sense. You've probably had the opportunity... To, to watch somebody else make decisions and go down a path and you were standing there almost pulling your hair out saying, why are you doing this? Don't you see what you're doing? This is, this is ridiculous. This is, this is stupid. And, and yet, if you're honest and you look back over your own life, you'd probably have to admit that there have been a couple paths where you've gone down. And you, you look back now and you say, boy, that was dumb. Why would I, why did I do that? Well, Sin makes you stupid. Sin will make you do things that you, you, you'll look back on and say, this, that didn't make any sense. So what, what do we do? Well, we walk close to the Lord. We spend time in his word. Because the closer you get to God, the harder it's going to be for you to fall for the nonsense that sin tries to push down on. So get close to God and walk in his word and allow him to guide you in the path that you should be. The Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord delights in his way. Get close to God. Will, will, you, ever, will you ever fall? Yeah. What will happen? Well, if you're walking with the Lord, the Bible says that a, a just man falls seven times, yet he rises up again. Make sure that we're doing that. Any thoughts, questions, or comments that you have maybe on something that we've looked at here in 1 Samuel 23 here this evening? Yes, sir. Whether you have 600 men or you have 3,000, I mean, there's not a lot of 
Hy-Vees or fairways out there to pick up some food, is there? No. <laughs> I mean, how, how, how do they sustain themselves? That just amazes me how they can. Looks like pretty desolate ground to me. Huh? Yeah. Well, a lot of times, and we'll see when, when we get to the point where David meets Abigail and Nabal, one of the things that they would do is David and his men would go and they would protect the town, and the town would, would reward them with food. They would reward them with, with pay, and they could send off. He could send some of his men, hey, go into town and buy buy enough cheeseburgers for 600 men. I don't know how that have some means yeah. because... Yeah, it would it would take a lot. Yeah, how do you how do you how do you subsist in that type of an environment? It would take some doing. Especially when you're being chased. Oh yeah, yeah. Not a lot of not a lot of DoorDash making its way to those caves. I'm sure. So. Well, the Lord probably sent a lot of ravens out there. To feed them. <laughs> could could be. Yeah, the Lord Lord miraculously fed him. Perhaps we don't know. Any other thoughts? Allow these stories that we look over, some of them very, very familiar, some of them less so. Make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to. The Bible says that these things are written for our examples so that they can build our faith. If God could take care of David in En Gedi, you think God can meet your needs in Wayland? I bet he can. God, God's a good God. And we serve the same God that David did. We serve the same God. He's still in the same business. He's still honoring those who will walk with him, and he's still judging those who choose not to. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word, for the stories it contains. Lord, we thank you for the fact that it contains the, the good and, and, Lord, the not so good about the characters that it, it records. Lord, we look at Saul, and Lord, as we started this study, we saw so much potential. A young man who was humble. Who, who seem to have a desire to serve you. And yet, Lord, we come here to chapter 23, and Lord, we see him just completely off the rails. Lord, I pray that we would take it as a cautionary tale, that we would understand that, that there but for the grace of God could be us. Lord, I pray that we would walk close to you, that we would allow you to guide our steps. We thank you once again for the privilege that we have to come into your presence, Lord, the privilege we have to worship together in a free country. I pray that you keep us safe as we go our separate ways and bring us back at the next appointed time. Give, give healing to those who are sick right now, Lord, and, and continue to bless with health. We'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.